I had shared as we were uh, closing up our last sermon series that we'd be moving on to a series on uh, church membership. But as a staff, we decided to put that off uh, until the fall. And um, that left, uh, left us in a little bit of lurch. What are we going to... What are we going to do until then? That gave us six weeks to, um, to fill up with wonderful, stimulating, God-blessing sermons. And uh, we didn't have a thing. Um, we uh, are usually three to four months ahead on what our scriptures are going to be and what our sermon titles are going to be. It uh, gives Larry time to pick music and, and prepare the worship services. And not that none of that's changeable as the Spirit prompts, uh, but, um, you know, at least it, it gets us thinking forward. And, uh, and I was going, okay, God, well, what are we going to do? And uh, as early as probably a week and a half ago, we still had nothing for this Sunday. And it, was, it was about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, that God sort of hit me upside of the head by a comment that somebody somebody made about grace and God said that's what you're going to do for the next few weeks you're going to teach on grace and mercy um, so that's where we find ourselves today grace and mercy we're going to just talk about the basic concepts of grace and mercy today. Next week we're going to uh, spend uh, particularly on grace and the difficulty that we as Christians have and struggle with being graced and giving grace. And, and then another week on mercy and the struggles we have with mercy. And then we're going to tie it all up in a nice neat bow and talk about how it's through humility and trusting God that we are able to not only exhibit but take in these wonderful, wonderful blessings of God. So we're going to start off with grace this morning. What is grace? When you hear that word, what does it mean to you? See, grace refers to the undeserved favor granted to you by God through salvation to an undeserving individual. See, it's easy to give things to people who deserve it. You work all week and you deserve your paycheck and you get a paycheck. You don't get that paycheck just simply because they like you or because they wanted to give you a special gift, you get that paycheck because you've earned it and you've worked for it. Grace is not like that. God chose to bless you. Even though you didn't deserve it. It is through grace that God makes the unacceptable acceptable. The unforgiven, forgiven. The unmerited, merit. I was a Boy Scout and, and uh, really took pride in all my merit badges that I earned as a Boy Scout. I made it to Life Scout, which is one step down from Eagle. Um, and the only reason I didn't stay in because all my friends told me Boy Scouts wasn't cool. So I said, okay, well, I'm... I'm cool, I'm quitting. And I quit and I regret it ever since. But I love those merit badges. But did the scoutmaster ever just say, John, you deserve a merit badge, here's one. I had to earn those merit badges, that's right. I had to work hard for those merit badges. My water safety merit badge, part of the water safety merit badge was you had to swim for a mile. Okay. And we would do this at summer camp, and there was a big rock in the middle of the lake, which was about a half a mile out, and you had to swim to the big rock, touch the rock, and swim back. Well, I'll tell you what, ever since I was a child, even up to today, when I get in water, I sink. I envy those people who just float. And, there's, and that's not an overweight joke. There are overweight people who float, and there are skinny people who float. 
It's just something to do with the way you're made. Some people float, some people don't. I'm a sinker. <laughs> so you'd see some guys out there and they'd be swimming and they'd be doing their strokes and then they'd flip over to the back and they'd float a minute and take a break. And, you know, and then they'd flip back over and they'd swim a little bit more. I had to fight for an entire mile to finish that mirror badge. But I earned it. And I got it. And I was proud of it. See, but you can't earn grace. You can do nothing to get it. It is given to you only by God because He loves you. Here's a little uh, an acronym, I think it's called an acronym. Uh, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. It is because what Jesus did on the cross and His subsequent resurrection back to life that God poured out His grace on us. He loves us in spite of ourselves. He loves us when we're doing the right thing or when we're doing the wrong thing. I often think of grace as a parent who, who loves their children and forgives them regardless of whether or not they deserve it. How many times has your child been undeserving Yet you bless them. Because that's what parents do. God does that for us. If we look at our scripture this morning, our primary text in Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 25, it says very clearly that all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That means that you have tried to swim and you have sunk. And you can't make it on your own. But we are justified freely by His grace. It is God's grace that justifies us, that makes us right, that turns the wrong into a right and makes us his. How? That came through the redemption by Christ Jesus because God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. A penalty was paid through the shedding of his blood and all we need do is receive it by faith. God did all the work because we couldn't. Elizabeth was talking about keys this morning and, and I, I liked that comparison she made to the key of heaven. You don't have to earn a certain amount of money to get that key. You don't have to live on a certain street to get that key. You don't have to do anything to get that key except accept what God has done for you by faith. And the key to heaven is placed in your heart. We can also look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10, where it talks about grace as well. It says, and God raised us up with Jesus, or Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Not only is his grace free, not only is there nothing you can do to earn it, but it is extraordinarily valuable. Grace is in the, the heavenly storehouses of heaven 
being poured out on God's children from the heavenly realms because God loves us. Verse 8 and following, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of anything you've done for yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now some people say, okay, he just said it's not by works, but we were created to do good works. What is it? Do I have to do something or don't I? Here's the thing. You don't have to do anything for grace. But once you receive it, you want to give back. There is, a, there is or there should be a compulsion to want to pour yourself back out into the lives of others. Because of what God's done for you. Not so that you can get anything else from God. Not so that you can say, okay, I've earned this now. Whew. I didn't like it when it was free, but now that I've earned it, I'm okay. Now, that's not how it works. Grace is undeserved favor. And all you need to do is believe in Him, and it's yours. What a blessing that is. And if we look at mercy, we say, okay, well, aren't they the same thing? What is, what is mercy as compared to grace? Mercy is given by God as the foundation of forgiveness. Mercy is God's compassion or pity on an undeserving individual. God sees you and He has mercy on you. He has compassion for you. He takes pity in your separation from Him. And He pours out His grace that through faith you might accept it and be whole in Him. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy. We've heard those lines in Scripture. We've heard them in, in movies. We, we've read them in books. What does it mean? God, show your compassion. Even though I don't deserve it. No, I haven't earned it. Love me for who I am. Don't we all want to be loved? And don't we all want to be loved for who we are, right where we are? Well, I'll love you if you do this. Or I will love you if, if you just get a little bit better. Or I'll really love you maybe if you just lose a few pounds. Or change your hair. Or wear your makeup differently. Or get a better job. Boy, we put restrictions and and, and uh, caveats on everything. But God says simply, I love you just the way you are. And I have compassion on you just where you are. And I'm willing to pour my grace out on you just where you are. Let's look at our second primary text today, Titus 3. Verses 4 through 7. Let me go ahead one. I'll come back to that other one. Titus 3, 4 through 7. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of His mercy. Again, it's not anything we can do to earn it. It's not anything we can do to deserve it. He did it through Christ because He loves us. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So having been justified 
by his grace, we might become heirs having hope and eternal life. Again, it is God's work, not ours. If we turn uh, back to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, just above what we looked at previously, it says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. For it is by grace you have been saved. Let's go back and look at our acronym for mercy. The Messiah's everlasting release from the condemning yoke of sin. That's what mercy is. God says, you're free. But I haven't paid the price. I haven't paid my fine. I haven't served my time. And God says, but you're free. But I haven't earned it. I don't deserve it. No one cares. And God says, but you're free. How can you do that, God? Why would you do that, God? I don't deserve it. And he says, you're right. You don't deserve it. But I love you. And I'm giving it to you for free. Wow. That's mercy. That's grace. I think one of the best pictures of that in all of Scripture can be found in the Gospel of John, the 8th chapter. There's a picture of it right here. I'm going to pick up John chapter 8, verse 3. It says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of, of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded that such a woman should be stoned. Now what do you say? Now they were using this question to trap in order to have a, a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write in the sand with his finger. And they kept questioning him on it. And he straightened up and said to them, Okay, let any one of you who is without sin throw the first stone. And again he stooped and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who had heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one to condemn you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Everything in the culture of Jesus said this woman deserved to die. She had broken the religious law. She had broken the, the law of the land. She had broken every natural rule of morality. And in one way, Jesus said, you're absolutely right. That's the law. She deserves to die. So, any of you who are perfect... Go ahead and hurl that stone at her head and knock her out. Go ahead. They just start to drop the rocks. It says the older ones left first because they were wise. They know they're stinkers. The young ones who are all excited, oh, we're going to get her. And they see the older guys leaving and you know, sort of pull up the britches and sort of walk away the other way. They said, those guys aren't hanging around. I'm not hanging around. Until it's just Jesus and her. And he said, where are they? And she says, they've gone. And Jesus could as easily have said, I pour out my grace and mercy on you. Go and sin.
Now, you might say, well, I, I'm, certainly, I'm certainly not a prostitute. I, I'm not breaking the law. That's a strong word, but in so many ways, so many of us are prostitutes. We prostitute ourselves at work. We prostitute ourselves at school. We're doing things to get something. That's what prostituting means. If we take away the sexual component from it. Simply means I am doing something to get something for me because I want it. I don't believe in it. I don't care about it. I'm going to take advantage of you through it, and I'm going to get what I want. Gosh, we're all guilty of that, one way or another. So Jesus stands with you right now and says, where are your accusers? And in your spirit's eye, you can look around, and there is no one there but you and Jesus. And he says, then go. And said no more. Amen.